Okay, <clears throat> good evening. Time for me to fix my damn captions. Wouldn't be a Menace Gilgalad broadcast without that. Okay, there we should be good. And while I'm at it, just in case I decide to game later, We'll go ahead and fix this one. Probably will game tonight after this reading. All right. There we go. The usual fix is done. So, time to settle in. We've got an article on Joan of Arc tonight, and then one followed by something on, on, on alchemists. So... Okay, so Joan of Arc revealed what has history left out of her strange saga by Jeff Nisbet. We've had a few articles by him so far. All right, jump into it. Oh, and this is number 27, by the way, in case you're keeping track. On May 30th, 1431, a young girl was burned alive for heresy and witchcraft in Rouen, France. According to one account of the day, when she had succumbed to the flames, the fire, quote, was raked back and her naked body shown to all the people and all the secrets that could or would belong to a woman to take away any doubts from people's minds. When they had stared long enough at her dead body bound to the stake, the executioner got a big fire going again, round her poor carcass, which was soon burned, both flesh and bone reduced to ashes, end quote. Although history tells us the victim was Joan of Arc, a simple shepherdess known then as Joan the Maid, the account of her execution shows even her gender was in doubt at the time, a doubt put to rest perhaps just a tad too neatly in the historical record. Joan deserves a closer look. Born on January 6th, 1412, Joan is one of the of history's best documented figures, hardly surprising considering that the records of her several trials still survive. At the age of 13, a voice told Joan she had been chosen by the quote-unquote King of Heaven to bring, quote, reparation to the Kingdom of France and help and protect uh, help and protection, sorry, to King Charles, end quote. Which much, uh, with much of France under English domination, French sovereignty was in dire straits. The forces of England's Henry V had invaded in 1415, uh, dealing the French a crushing defeat at Agincourt. When Henry died in 1422, the English controlled all of France north of the Loire River, and in 1428 laid siege to France's last stronghold in the region, Orléans. Making matters worse, the French throne was itself in dispute. 
King Henry had married the daughter of Charles VI of France, and under the terms of the 1420 Treaty of Troyes, Henry soon was named heir to the throne over the Dauphin Charles, son of the French king. Adding insult to injury, the tale was spread that Charles was illegitimate, a tale his own widowed mother, Isabeau, endorsed. Isabeau was in, enjoying the protection of the French Burgundians allied to England, so what's a mother to do? While the Burgundians held Paris, the Dauphin held a pitifully ineffectual court at Chinon. Then, on March 4th, 1429, Joan showed up. <clears throat> she was granted an audience with the Dauphin on March 6th, and with divine help recognized him even though he was in disguise. She impressed him so she impressed him by privately relating a secret only he should know. She was then vetted by a court which recommended that Charles set Joan at the head of his armies. The rest is a history that is known well enough to be covered only briefly here. Joan raised the siege at Orléans and drove out the English. <clears throat> Excuse me. She then led the Dauphin to his coronation as Charles, King Charles VII, and after a brief yet glorious military career, was captured by the Burgundians, sold to the English, tried, and then burned at the stake, while France's new king looked the other way. Twenty-four years later, Joan was tried again posthumously, and in 1456 the original verdict was nullified. More than 500 years after her birth, Joan of Arc was canonized Saint Joan in 1920. Cold comfort to Joan the Maid. But the sworn testimony that paints the picture of Joan that we are <clears throat> now expected to accept is a weird mix of the believable and the unbelievable, the commonplace and the miraculous. Although many swore to the testimony given, only a few privileged hands recorded it. So why must we believe what they have written? Perhaps instead of accepting what they wrote, we should look elsewhere. In previous articles, I have proposed the existence of a secret brotherhood with both the knowledge of the, and the clout to orchestrate certain historical pivotal events on earth that simultaneously mirror the arrangement of the heavens above. The article suggests that these events are staged not only because out of the resulting smoke and thunder are born heroes and symbols, guaranteed to weather the winds of time, but also because they are scripted to shape a nation's sense of identity for centuries to come. <clears throat> Scotland has Robert the Bruce. America has the Star Spangled Banner. France has Joan of Arc. One need only look at Joan's entourage during her glory days to see a troop now recognized as players in the underground stream of knowledge, stream of knowledge game. Under the terms of the old, old alliance between Scotland and France, many of Joan's comrades were members of the Scots Guard. This was a group thought to have held strong ties to the Knights Templar, whose inner circle may have escaped from France to Scotland upon the Order's 1307 suppression for heresy, at which time they chose to quickly disappear. While today's sizable Templar fan club subscribes to that theory, my opinion is that the Knights' inner circle had taken the forward-thinking view that it was time to right-size the corporation, and it had done just that. <clears throat> and then there is René d'Anjou, one of Joan's companions on her trip to meet the Dauphin. One of René's many titles was King of Jerusalem. Purely titular, the des designation had nevertheless descended from Godfrey de Bouillon, who, as Michael Bajon and R Richard Lay assert in their book Holy Blood, Holy Grail, had founded the shadowy Priory of Sion, which in turn had founded the Knights Templar. René is known to have been a close friend of the young Leonardo da Vinci, who later in life is thought to have been Grand Master of the Priory. Quote, Many have made a trade of delusions and false miracles, deceiving the stupid multitude. 
end quote, Leonardo wrote. He also held the highly heretical belief that Jesus was a twin, but more about twins later. And before I go on, there is a picture. Joan of Arc Kisses the Sword of Liberation, a famous 19th century painting by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. So there we have it. <clears throat> All right. One of the suspiciously precise details we know about Joan is her exact time of birth, one hour after sunset on January 6th, a day variously known as the Feast of the Epiphany, the Day of the Three Kings, and the Twelfth Day of Christmas. Surprisingly, neither Joan's mother nor any other witnesses at the nullification trial mentions that Joan's birthday was an official holy day. Considering the trial was meant to show that Joan's mission had indeed been divinely inspired, I found that silence curious, and so I decided to consult a record I had discovered during my previous research, that of the arrangement of the heavens on the day in question. Shortly before dawn on that day of January 6th, 1412, the planet Mercury, messenger of the gods, rose above the bow of the constellation, the bow, sorry, of the constellation Sagittarius, the archer, while Venus, the morning star and symbol of the goddess in many pre-Christian traditions, sat on the bicep of the, of the arm that drew the bow. Then came the sun hiding the heavens in the light of day. In Shakespeare's Henry VI, written 179 years later, the Dauphin challenges Joan to a mock sword fight. Soundly trounced, Charles calls Joan the, quote, bright star of Venus, fallen down on the earth, end quote. Let's now consider the name Arc, which in French means bow, and was also has also come to mean the leap electricity makes between unconnected points. It's intriguing that in, on Joan's birthday, Venus drew the bow, perhaps to indicate that a woman had been chosen to let fly an arrow of hidden truth into the future, while Mercury, also known as Hermes, would speed it on its way. And though the Shakespearean Dauphin's re reference to Joan as Venus fits this scenario neatly, a prophecy that had caught the imagination of the day fairly shivers with resonance. Attributed to Merlin, the prophecy foretold that a virgin riding Sagittarius would save France. Uranus followed the sun on Joan's birthday. Oldest of the gods, Uranus sat on the head of Capernic Capricorn, the goat, a figure some speculate is of an enormous Templar significance. One common depiction shows a winged creature with the head of a male goat on a human torso with female breasts and a mid-forehead star. It is presenting a bright moon above and a dark moon below, a very telling hermetic image. Considered by some to be Baphomet, the entity the Templars have accused of, were accused of worshipping, it waits 18 years to appear again in the life of Joan. And that actually, that Baphomet depiction is very common on the internet. It's attributed to um, Eliphas Levy, Levy, a French magician, ceremonial magician, um, and, and historian, if, in case you didn't know that. The drawing of it is, not the concept of it, but his particular drawing is wide, widely available if you want to look at it. Um, 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 um. When Joan is dis received by the Dauphin on March 6th, Venus is riding the back of Capricorn, and in Henry the Sixth, a messenger brings news of Joan as, quote, a holy prophetess new risen up, end quote. In an initi initiatory rite of the Freemasons, a fraternity thought to have continued the legacy of the Templars, initiates are raised into the order from a symbolic death, and one of the persistent tales told about the, the rite is is that initiates must also ride the back of a goat. But back to Joan's nativity. 
As the sun set in the west, the Orion constellation rose in the east. Since I have discussed Orion's sin significance in previous articles, I will not do so here, except to add that tiny and distant Pluto sat above Orion's head like an invisible crown. To Orion's left, the planet Neptune, god of the oceans, separated the Gemini twins, and the twelfth day of Christmas be became twelfth night, the night that Joan was born. One hour after sunset, weather permitting, Orion and Gemini would be shining brightly in the eastern sky. Scholars have long argued the significance of Shakespeare's title, Twelfth Night, or What You Will, um, since the play offers no explanation. It is the story of twins, male and female, who are separated by a storm at sea, each thinking the other has drowned. The woman masquerades as a man, and until the end of the play, there is much gender confusion with a little cross-dressing thrown in for good measure. Since the historical record conveniently tells us that Joan was born on Twelfth Night, it's interesting that Neptune, named after the god of the oceans, separated the Gemini twins on the night of her birth, just as Shakespeare's twins are separated by a storm at sea. Methinks, perchance, the bard's mighty quill writ two tales, one hidden in the other. Apart from the King James Bible, commissioned by Britain's first officially Freemasonic king, no books have enjoyed greater sales figures than those containing the plays of William Shakespeare, and yet their authorship remains hotly debated. A top contender as the author-editor of both works is Francis Bacon, the English philosopher who lived contemporaneously with Shakespeare. Thought to have played a key role in the birth of the Rosicrucians, an esoteric brotherhood with Templar and Freemasonic ties, Bacon may have secretly worked to put a system in place whereby lost knowledge might eventually be rediscovered. He also shares resident connections with the twins. <clears throat> Bacon's coat of arms shows two soldiers, likely Castor and Pollux, the Gemini twins. His motto, Mediorcia Firma, has been interpreted as the middle ground is safest. In an age when heresy could get you burned at the stake, perhaps Bacon was merely protecting himself by not taking credit for saying too much too soon, preferring to let his rather milquetoast motto speak sterner stuff in times to come. In the 572 years since Joan's death, historians have been plagued by two pesky groups of revisionists, the bastardizers and the survivalists. The bastardizers claim that Joan was not a simple shepherdess, but was in fact the illegitimate daughter of Queen Isabeau and her brother-in-law, Louis of Orléans, which would make Joan the half-sister of the Dauphin and also, consequently, the aunt of Henry VI, of England through the marriage of the Dauphin's sister to Henry V. The survivalists claim that Joan escaped execution thanks to the secret efforts of her principal judge, Pierre Cochon, uh, and others in the English camp. Within 25 years of Joan's execution, several brave souls claimed to be Joan of Arc. It is interesting that one of these impostors was pardoned in 1457 by no less a personage than René d'Anjou, Joan's companion at arms and titular king of Jerusalem. It is highly unlikely that Joan was born on the day that history records, a day when the heavens were so o were oh so conveniently arranged. It is more probable that she was born earlier and then delivered to foster parents on that astronomically auspicious day, for the record. <clears throat> it is also more probable that Joan of Arc's miraculous career was orchestrated by the will of a cognoscenti that followed a mutually 
agreed upon secret agenda from opposite sides of the battlefield, a brother th brotherhood that counted the many thousands of ensuing war casualties as acceptable collateral damage and which would continue to quietly promote a spirit of nationalistic and adversarial competition that would become very useful when the time came to divvy up and populate the new world soon to be discovered to the West. The first cartogra cartographic appearance of the name America appears on Martin Vald Valdsmuller's 1507 map, produced under the patronage of Duke René d'Anjou II, who had inherited the title King of Jerusalem from his grandfather. The map has recently been purchased by the U.S. Library of Congress for $5 million and will be the crown jewel of its map collection, Caveat Emptor. Finally, whereas the position of the six ancient planets on Joan's official birthday could have been easily predicted at the time, the positions of the three modern planets should have been problematic. Uranus, conveniently on the head of the goat, would not be discovered until 1781. Neptune between the twins in 1850, and Pluto above Orion's head in 1933. Hmm, perhaps they were simply allowed to be prudently rediscovered when the time was right. Francis Bacon wrote, quote, I begin to be weary of the sun. I have shaken hands with delight and know all, all is vanity, and I think no man can live well once but he that could, ha that could live twice. For my part, I would not live over m my hours past or begin again the minutes of my days. Not because I have not lived well, but for fear that I should live them worse. I enjoy no man that knows more than myself, but pity them that know less. Now in the midst of all my endeavors, there is but one thought that dejects me, that my acquired parts must perish with myself, nor can be legacied amongst my dearly beloved and honored friends. End quote. Although the girl whose body climbed the sky in a plume of smoke over Rouen in, on May 30th, 1431, may never be known for who she truly was, she might some day be known for who she was not. Francis Bacon, in his way, made sure of it. Quote, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. End quote. Indeed. And that is the end of that article. That one went quick. 24 minutes, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the next one, Article 28, is on the on alchemists. So let's dive into it. Um, we have a different author this time. So unless anybody has anything to add or comment on about Joan of Arc. I don't know if anybody remembers, but there were two movies that came out pretty close together. Um, there was one, there was a TV movie that was, um, Lily Sobieski was the star of it. She was Joan of Arc. And then a very different take on Joan of Arc with, um, oh God, I, uh, Mila Jovovich. Um, it was called The Messenger, where she was this really angry, vengeful um, Joan of Arc, which was very different. You know, the Sobieski one, she was very pious and, you know, godly and, and you know, following God's plan and all that. And then these, um, in the Mila Jovovich one, she was just using that as more of an excuse to just kill English. She just hated the English. So very different takes. If you ever get a chance to watch them both, you should. Anyway, moving on. 28, The Alchemist's Resurrection. Did the ancient arts of transmutation die with the Middle Ages, or did they, do they still survive in different disguises? By Mark Stavish. Mention alchemy to someone, and what does he usually think of? 
the Middle Ages with old men in some forgotten attic laboring over bubbling flasks filled with some unknown fluid or in front of an oven trying to turn molten lead into gold. These are the images of the alchemists that time, mythology, and prejudicial history have handed down to us. It is true that many of the early alchemists were the forerunners of the modern scientists. Physi physics and chemistry are indebted to these early puffers, quote-unquote puffers, as they were disparagingly called. From their hours of sweat and travail, a host of modern advances came. Porcelain, alcoholic distillation, acids, salts, and a variety of metallic compounds. All are the results of early alchemical exper experiments. But if alchemy wasn't just a foolish waste of time in the search for a means to turn base metals into gold, what was it? <clears throat> the Egyptian connection. The word alchemy or alchemy is said to be the to be derived from Arabic or Egyptian, meaning either divine chemistry or possibly black earth, referring to the silt deposits from the annual flooding of the Nile River. However, regardless of where the word alchemy began, it has come to mean a very special form of spiritual development. Qigong is called alchem alchemy of the breath. From Plato's Greece to the European Renaissance, ancient Egypt was held to be the land, if not the origin, of all things mystical. <clears throat> the Egyptian god Thoth, or Thoth, called Hermes by the Greeks, was said to be the father of all magical arts and sciences, with numerous books on the laws governing creation being attributed to him. These books became the basis of most Western occult teachings and are known as the Hermetic Corpus or the Body of Hermes, which refers to the total collection of works attributed to the quote-unquote scribe of the gods. Okay, before we go on, we've got two pictures. I'll go ahead and get them out of the way. I think that's the only pictures. Yeah, so we'll just go ahead and do them. So the first one is, an alchemist in search of the philosopher's stone discovers phosphorus. And then I'll go ahead and read the caption for the other one. Um, L'alchemist by David Teniers, Teniers, the Younger, or Tenier, I don't know. Anyway, it's French. French was never my strong suit. Okay, so there is discovering phosphorus, and then l'alchemist here. All right, moving on. The teachings and practice contained in these writings are called Hermeticism, and in the Renaissance came to include aspects of Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, alchemy, the use of ritual, and communication with super-celestial beings or angels. It is important to remember that in the ancient world, and until the end of the Renaissance, the 16th century, magic was seen not as superstition, but as a logical and coherent means of understanding the universe and controlling one's destiny. Magic, imagination, and magnetism are all related both through their root mag and how they, how they are seen through the mind of the magician or alchemist. For the magician or even the alchemist, the universe is perceived as a reflection of the imagination of the Godhead. Its laws are consistent and logical, and if we are created in the image of the Creator, then we can also create as the Creator has through the power of an imagination. Intense imagination creates a stress on the fabric of the universe, drawing to it magnetic power, thus bringing our images to fruition. The fundamental ideas of Renaissance magic and alchemy are also found in Eastern yoga and are the basis for the New Age movement, as well as hypnotherapy, guided visualizations for mental health uh, or cancer treatment, affirmations, and an assortment of other psycho-spiritual practices. Until the last half of the 20th century, though 
most of these spiritual practices were kept secret or hidden, mostly out of fear of political or religious persecution. Hence, they became known as occult or hidden, since many of them used the same signs, symbols, and literature as contemporary religions, such as Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, the hidden occult or hermetic arts and sciences became known as esoteric, or the secret meaning behind exoteric, or everyday religious practices and dogma. This fear of persecution, of imprisonment or death, limited instruction in esoteric practices to a trusted few and was carried out only through a process of slow, careful, symbolic rituals and cryptic teachings known as initiations. Each of these initiations symbolized a step or grade in a student's inner journey toward illumination. During the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, dozens of, of initiatic orders and societies were established across Europe for the dissemination of spiritual teachings, the most prominent of them being the Rosicrucians, Freemasons, and Knights Templar. Some of them taught their members through moral instructions, such as the Freemasons. Others, such as the Rosicrucians, taught practical mysticism, the use of ritual, the, pr the structure of the universe through Kabbalah, and laboratory alchemy. Many of these organizations exist in Europe or in the United States in some form today. In alchemy, however, each of its steps or Phases represents not only an interior awakening, initiation, but also a physical, practical technique performed in the laboratory. The physical laboratory work becomes a means of verifying spiritual and psychic expansions in consciousness. Alchemy, it is said, is an initiatic system in which one has no delusions. It is the only initiatic path where there is an objective control in the laboratory. If an experiment shows that one has gone beyond the ordinary material laws of the universe, it shows that one is an alchemist who has had an interior awakening. This awakening corresponds to the rule that says, quote, you will transmute nothing if you have not transmuted yourself first, end quote, says Jean Dubuis, founder and first president of the French alchemical organization, the Philosophers of Nature. Dubuis has act actively practiced alchemy and related esoteric arts for nearly 65 years. Because of his extensive professional career in electrical engineering for a major international electronics firm in France and his work in the field of nuclear physics with Nobel Prize winner Joliot Curie, he has been described by fellow alchemists as one of the few people easily at home with both a periodic table of the elements and a Kabbalistic diagram. His spiritual path, he says, began when he had a spiritual awakening at the age of 12 in the island cathedral of Mont Saint Michel, uh, off the coast of Normandy. This awakening led Dubuis to a lifetime of activities and intimate involvement in European esoteric circles. He has held positions in the French-speaking branch of the Rosicrucian Order, AMORC, presiding over its Illuminati section of high-degree students, as well as in a number of esoteric orders and societies. After tiring of the various levels of secrecy and often the self-aggrandizing use of the power such vows bring, he renounced his memberships and established the Philosophers of Nature, P.O.N., to open the paths of alchemy and Kabbalah to everyone of good heart and mind. This is expressed in his view of the basic philosophy behind alchemy. Quote, alchemy is the science of life, of consciousness. The alchemist knows that there is a very solid link between matter, life, and consciousness. Alchemy is the art of manipulating life and consciousness in matter to help it evolve or solve the problem of inner disharmony. Matter exists only because it is created by the human seed. The human seed, the original man, created matter in order to in involute and evolve. You see, if we go beyond what I said, the absolute being is an auto-created being and we must become 
in its image auto-created beings. End quote, Dubuis said, during a recent interview at the annual conference of the Philosophers of Nature. A long quote. A similar statement was made by fellow Frenchman and alchemist Francois Trojani during an interview with Joseph Rowe in the summer 1996 issue of Gnosis. Quote, it, alchemy, is the dimension of interiority and of meaning in the deep sense, the meaning of life, the meaning of my life, questions about the relationship of spirit to matter, of the purpose and value of my own actions. The questions, where did I come from? Why am I here? Who am I? I'm not saying that alchemy provides precise answers to these questions, but that it operates in the dimension where these questions arise, end quote. Modern psychology. <clears throat> Just as esoteric initiation seeks to repair the psychic damages in humanity, so does its stepchild modern psychology. As a result, most folks today are familiar with alchemy through the extensive writings of Swiss psychologist Carl Gustav Jung. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jung was attracted to alchemy through a series of dreams he experienced as well as those of his patients and their resemblance to alchemical symbols representing the stages of self-development or individuation. However, for Jung, the entire alchemical work, or opus, was viewed from a strictly psychoanalytic perspective. Transmutation was the changing not of physical matter, but of psychological matter from destructive problems into life-enhancing attributes. Some of Jung's seminal works outlining the process of human individuation or self-becoming are found in his alchemical studies, in which he interprets the meaning of the key stages and symbols of alchemy to explain the internal stages of human evolution, or what alchemists call interior initiation. Laboratory alchemists cautiously point out that, despite his contributions and the critical aspect of psychological work in alchemy, Jung was not considered a real alchemist. According to Dubuis and others, for alchemy to be real alchemy, it must work on all levels of creation, spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical. While one or more can be left out and a transmutation of some sort affected, the results are not considered to be alchemical. It is true that Jung made some additions to symbolism and gave people a means to look at their interior life. Quote, as regards to alchemy, Jungian psychology shows that alchemy is a universal art and science and can lend itself to anything, but to reduce alchemy to a therapeutic allegory is a mistake, end quote, stated Russell House of Winfield, Illinois. House is the current president of the Philosophers of Nature and has studied alchemy with Jean de Bouy, Orval Graves, Frater Albertus, and Manfred Jan Junius, several of this century's leading laboratory alchemists. From 18, uh, sorry, 18, from 1989 to 1993, House also co-instructed the alchemy classes taught at Rosicois University, sponsored by the Rosicrucian Order AMORC in San Jose, California. Alternative Medicine Along with psycho-spiritual growth and physical transmutation, alchemy has long been associated with creating near-physical immortality as well as cures for incurable diseases. Dubuis has suggested that a carefully prepared tincture or an alchemically prepared medicine extracted with purified alcohol made from acorns might prove itself prove useful in fighting cancer and some autoimmune diseases. However, at least one of the major contributions of alchemy to alternative medicine is a little more accessible than either of these. That is homeopathy. Available in most drugstores and supermarkets, homeopathic medicines are based on the alchemical practices of the Swiss 16th century alchemist Paracelsus. However, it was not Paracelsus who created homeopathy. 
He only supplied the theory that like cures like, and that smaller doses of medicine could cure more easily and quickly than larger doses. Alchemical tinctures like homeopathic medicines are created from plants, minerals, and metals. Homeopathic treatment was formulated in 1796 and introduced to the United States in 1825. In Europe, alchemically prepared and homeopathic medicines are available in, to the general public. According to House, quote, for the genuine alchemists, healing, like alchemy, must be on all levels and treat the whole being or person, and within the context of nature and evolution, the intent of the healer must offer encouragement in the interior world of the patient and not work against nature's plan of evolution. Like homeopathy, Bach flower remedies, or aromatherapy, alchemical medicines work on a subtle level and a crude one at the same time, end quote. Quantum physics. Since its inception, alchemy has been associated with the idea of transmutation or the fundamental change of one th thing, usually a base metal such as lead, into something else, in this case gold. But is transmutation possible? For alchemists, past and present, the answer is a resounding yes. Trojani is quoted as saying the transmutation, that transmutation, has taken place and continues to be done. The reason given is that alchemical operations do not take place on the level of the periodic table of elements, but instead on the fabric of time and space itself. This work on the elements of space and time can constitutes work directly on oneself. In fact, Dubuis, Trojani, and their predecessor, Francois Jolivet Castellot, Castello, is the T silent? Anyway, uh, all agree that not only is transmutation possible, but that it might not require much of the high tech, high energy equipment that we have come to associate with subatomic physics. Jolivet, Jolivet Castellot wrote a book for the aspiring alchemist, Comment on Deviant, oh, Comment on Deviant Alchemist, How to Become an Alchemist, 1897. Outlining the range of hermetic disciplines required and giving practical advice on purchasing laboratory equipment as well as on the moral requirements of the alchemist. Harvey Spencer Lewis, the founder and head of the American Rosicrucian Order, AMORC, was familiar with Jolivet Castellot and his work. In 1915, Lewis himself is said to have transmuted a piece of zinc into gold using little more than an open flame and a crucible. The accounts of this public demonstration have been published several times in the organization's magazine, the, the Rosicrucian Digest. In addition, in the August 1926 edition of The Mystic Triangle, AMORC published Jolivet Castellot's account of his own transmutation of base metal into gold, as well as the recipe for carrying it out. In more recent times, alchemy has been investigated as a means of supplying cheap energy and for the potential creation of quote-unquote supermetals. At the Palladian Academy's conference in January 1997 near Vicenza, Vicenza Italy, sorry, uh, Professor Christopher McIntosh, author of The Rosicrucians and member of UNESCO's educational office, Hamburg, Germany, mentioned that the United Nations had recently sponsored a conference of its own in which alchemy was considered as, pos as a possible tool for the creation of new alloys. Okay. Along similar lines, Dubuis offered some insights into the phenomenon of UFOs. Quote, first of all, there are two hypotheses for extraterrestrials. The first hypothesis, 
says that on Earth, if you are close to the North Pole, there is some kind of fraternity of advanced people that checks on the global functioning of humanity and that the flying saucers are theirs. The second hypothesis is that you cannot come from distant systems to Earth in everyday physical conditions. So I think that things happen thus. In the system that they start from, they put advanced people on board, and the speed of energy is multiplied by a hundred thousand or a million. They can come here rapidly, and then they enter the aura, and when they enter the aura of the Earth, they are brought back level by level and, de and rematerialized. Quote, what? I thought I was reading a quote. Where did the quote end? Here's another quote starting. I don't know where that one ended, or if they just forgot the quotations. I don't know and I don't want to know if the Roswell, New Mexico story is true, but the details that have been given lead me to believe it is true because they found material that go back to the invisible to the invisible where they should be. They said the brain of the person had no barrier. This means that they are people that have no barrier between the visible and the invisible worlds. I don't know about the other organs. If it is a fake, then the people who have produced it have a very big knowledge of the occult, end quote, Dubuis said. And that is the end of that article. So um, our next one for um, Thursday um, will be Falconelli and the Mysteries of the Cathedrals. Okay. And Isaac Newton and the Occult. So those should be interesting. Um, yeah. Just looking ahead a little bit. It looks like we've got a bunch of Isaac Newton stuff. And then we get into Gurdjieff, which um, interests me. And then we're done with that, and we're into part six, the spirit and the soul. So, yeah. All righty. We'll leave it off there and go pour an adult beverage and come back and do a little gaming, I think. So I will see you all either in the next um, stream or um, tomorrow night is Star Wars short story. Thursday is another reading from Forbidden Religion. Friday is back to Star Wars with some comics. I skipped on Monday, so some more of the um, Knights of the Old Republic series that we're reading right now. Um, three issues at a time. Um, yeah, so there we go. I will see you all later or tomorrow. <laughs>